Hello, welcome to Resurrection Baptist Church's Love Bible Study Group. Tonight we are going to go over the four serious questions that Pastor Helm had spoken about in his last Bible class. And you've had enough time to actually meditate on those questions and think about them. Now tonight, as we get ready to prepare, I'd like you to really consider maybe for the first time to call our toll-free number because I do want to have a conversation and interactive with you all tonight. So if you can, dial in 701-802-5490 and the access number is 689- 1152 and put the actual pounds on. So if you can dial in, that would be great because we want to talk about some things tonight. And I believe these are opportunities for us to grow. Now I'll start the prayer and then we'll do the reading of the actual Bible uh, chapters of the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible. Thank you, Father, for this privilege and opportunity tonight to learn of you. We pray that we have ears to hear. We ask, God, that we decrease as the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, enlightens us about the Word of God, the Word that became flesh. And we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the salvation that he's given through his sacrifice of his blood. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all of the wonderful love and grace and mercy that you provided to us. And we ask that if anyone is under the sounds of my voice in the midst of this teaching, God, and they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal, loving, saving way, Father, that something that will be said and shared of your love, of your gospel, the good news of Christ, would touch them through the Holy Spirit to let them know that they must be saved in order to have an eternal relationship with Jesus. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus, for your will to be done this day, this hour. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. So, amen. in order for us to realize we're in a class, and in a class it's unique because we're doing some things in different forms. We have a toll-free number, as I just shared, but we also are on Facebook, and some of you are just kind of listening through your phones. But if you want to have the conversation, try to call in, and if you can, type questions. Uh, someone is here to help me this evening, but it would be really great if you could call in. And I will do my best to make sure that I repeat conversations or the summary of things that are said on the phone so that those of you who are watching through Facebook can at least hear them. So let's go to the books of the Bible. Now, the reason why Resurrection wants all of us to learn about the books of the Bible, because as you're starting to hear, whether you're in the preached word on a Sunday or whatever, your Bible study or prayer meeting, you'll hear the books of the Bible called. And depending on if you know them, it will take you a little bit of time to find the books. So when you're just learning, it's okay to go to the index of the very front of your Bible, and there's a list of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's why you always hear 37 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. So that's what's going on. So I always tell people who are just learning as well that it's okay to just learn how, they're sound, how they sound, for you to practice so you can hear what they sound. You can go to YouTube and hear different people pronounce them. But it's, it's good to learn them, write them down, and to study them. So look, we're going to start, and we're going to go pretty slowly, because I know everyone does not know them, but I want us to learn. So let's start. Ready, set, go. Genesis, Genesis Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy Joshua, Joshua, Judges, Judges Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 
Second Corinthians. Galatians. Ephesians. Philippians. Colossians. First Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. First Timothy. Second Timothy. Titus. Philemon. Hebrews. James. First Peter. Second Peter. First John. Second John. Third John. Jude. Revelation. Right. The last book of the Old Testament is pronounced Malachi. Malachi. Yeah, there you go. Malachi. Malachi. I have a nephew, a great nephew named Malachi. So of the, the questions, there were only four. And how I'd like to have us actually discuss them is that if you're on the call and if you're on the Facebook, if you have an answer personally for the four questions, I would like you to bring a scripture with what you give as your answer. I'll show you what I mean as I do the personal reaction for myself, but I want you to say a scripture. I have my puppy here with me. So I want you to think about what you want as an answer, but think of a scripture passage to go along with what you say. Because a lot of times as Christians, we get questioned and we give opinions, but God doesn't say our opinions will not return void. He says the scriptures. So we want to make sure that we use the scriptures when we start to look at these questions that we really have been supposed to be contemplating and introspecting and reflecting over almost three weeks. And a lot has happened in three weeks. In three weeks, Reverend Helm went on to be the Lord. In three weeks, the COVID cases for our children, for people unvaccinated, all these things have changed. In three weeks, so much has happened to you and to I. And you have to start having these times where you really seriously think about some of these questions when it comes to your faith and your relationship with Jesus Christ. So the first question that was asked was, when did you become serious about the word of God? And the question was posed as, do you know what age? Do you know what the sermon, what the time was? And this is about the word of God. The word of God, we're distinguishing from question one to two. The first one is the word. The scriptures, the real scriptures of the word. When did you become serious about the word of God? Now, one of the things that I started Milkshake Monday, I'm going to give you this scripture. The seriousness about the word of God happened when I was in middle school. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. When did I get serious? What was the age, the time, the sermon? Well, Reverend Helm, when he asked this question, he was very specific. Now, I don't know if I have all the exact answers for that, but I could tell you, I found myself always hearing the scriptures, but when you start to get more serious about your faith, and at the time I was with a youth group, called Your House Incorporated in Loudoun County, Leesburg, Virginia. And as we started having activities where we were going to different places, the movies, going to the beach, I started hearing the scriptures in a more intimate way where I felt that the Lord was drawing me. The Holy Spirit was actually drawing me to have a relationship with him, but he was doing it through the scriptures and how people were talking. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about us being carnally minded. And at that time, I've been going to church. My mom and everybody in my family, I was in church since I was a child. I was doing work for the Lord. I was hearing scriptures. I knew things that are in Sunday school. I could say different things. But I had a carnal mind. I didn't have a mind that was connected through faith in Jesus Christ. I was playing church. And I know that's an expression that some of you may understand, but I was playing church. I wasn't connected to the vine. I was around it. I understood what was happening, but I just wasn't connected. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, 
as to babes in Christ. I wasn't even a babe yet because in order to be a babe in Christ, you have to accept Christ and he has to know you and you have to know him. I wasn't at that stage. I was carnally minded. But yet these people in this Christian youth group were sharing the message of Jesus Christ, sharing the word of God. And it wasn't returning void. It was penetrating my heart because I was going through this phase where I felt even after my father passed away, that there was something missing. It was a void in my heart. It was something empty. I kind of felt like I wanted to go somewhere, be somewhere. I just was not comfortable, but I didn't know what was going on. As the scripture was being taught every week at somebody's house that I may see in school and I was in their living room, I kept hearing the word of God. And so this scripture says here, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. I was hearing it and God was working on me, but I wasn't connected to the vine yet. I had to make that true profession of faith in Christ. So it was getting in my ears, but it wasn't deep in my heart because the Lord tells us that his word is a mystery. The kingdom of God and the things about the scripture are a mystery. And even sometimes when you listen to the Bible whether it's taught by Reverend Watts, or you hear old videos of Reverend Helm, or you hear Milkshake Monday, you may hear and understand some of it, but it doesn't just grab hold of you. It could, because, it could be because you know of God, but you don't know God. That's not a judgment I'm making. That's something I want you to understand, that we all have to be connected to the vine through Jesus Christ. We have to go to the Father, but only through Jesus Christ. And if you don't really receive him, and, and I can tell you that my story, I was trying to go to God, the Father, but I didn't want to deal with Jesus. That whole discussion about Jesus and the Son of God, I said, I want to forget Jesus. I want to go to the Father. And that was a stupid thing to think about. But as a kid, I said, why do I need to go through him? I'll just go straight to the Father. I'll just go to God. And that's not how it ever was going to be. You can't access the Father and His holiness without having the righteousness of His Son covering all of our sins. Well, that sounds real churchy, but for a, a child that was barely even 11 or 12, that's how I was thinking. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to do the Holy Communion. I didn't need to do things that God said I had to. But that's what I wanted you to understand. So, in this instance, that's one of the things. Here's another scripture that I want you to think about. I want you to look at all of... 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Because I want you to understand, I wasn't ready. I was receiving the word in a carnal state until I accepted Christ. And I want you all to see in Mark chapter 4. Because there's a lot of people that are going to church. And they are members of the body, of a church body. But that doesn't mean that they are also, that Christ knows them and that they know him. And I give you this proof out of the scripture. Let's go to where it says, I said Mark, but I meant Matthew. So in Matthew okay. chapter 7. Okay. I apologize. Okay. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, it talks about, and this is going to kind of teeter on to, to the number two question, but I'm going to start. You have to know Christ, but there are a lot of people who want to know the word, but until you have that relationship with Christ, you won't be able to understand so when Christ speaks in Matthew 7 about there's a time where he says, not everyone. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Many, and that's why I want you to understand, you want to know the word, but in order to know the word and hear the word and understand the mysteries, you got to know the part two of the second question, which when did you become serious about your relationship with Jesus Christ? And until you get serious about repenting and receiving Christ and believing that he is the only true son of God and believing that he had no sin and believing that you're accepting him. But see, this word on verse 22 says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. But look what he says. He says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practicers, 
you who practice lawlessness. Now, part one of the question that I asked you is, when did you become serious about the word of God? And if you know that answer, you'll be able to understand how the word of God and the spirit of God drew you to the Savior. Now, if you're at a point you say, I don't know when I ever got serious. Because if you don't know when you became serious about the word of God, you also have to understand, you understand, Jesus became flesh. He is the word of God. So go to John. I'm going to let you answer uh, Sister White if you have the answer for one and whoever joined. But go to John 1. Because if you don't know when you became serious about the word of God, it'll be hard for you to recognize the answer to the next question. So here's John 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So when you got that question, when did you become serious about the word of God? If you can't think of any time in your relationship with the Holy Scriptures, if you can't think of when you became serious, I want you to pause. I want you to go and get into your closet and I want you to talk to the Lord about that question because you may find that you were carnally minded like I was. You've been to church. You've been hearing the word. The word has been coming in your ears, but you haven't been connected through the Holy Spirit to the Savior. And that's why when it comes in, it comes in as a theoretical thing. It comes in as words, but it's not penetrating your heart, your soul, your spirit. Because you don't know Christ. And you don't understand that Christ is the word. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to the word because like the scripture says, the word was with God. The word was God. And that's Jesus Christ. As you keep reading, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And then it says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. When you are in your carnal state like that 1 Corinthians 3, you don't understand the void. You're not sure what the void is until you start to hear the word of God to explain to you that apart from God, you can do nothing. Apart from him, you don't have the light. Apart from him, there is no, that's no liberty. There's no freedom. There's no love. There's no understanding of the fruit of his spirit. See, that's what the Holy Spirit is drawing to each and every one of us. But seriously, if you don't have a time that you really identify when you became serious about the word of God, then you're going to have a hard time going to question two. Because if you don't serious about the word of God and you, can, you don't really care what the commandments say, what his laws and precepts say, because that's him. He became flesh. He became the truth. And the spirit of truth is his Holy Spirit, his comforter, his helper is there to draw all of us to know him even more through his scripture, through the Holy Spirit bringing to remembrance of the scripture, to the Holy Spirit giving us that enlightenment to know who Christ is. So I want to ask Sister White, if you feel comfortable to share with us, when do you believe that you became serious about the word of God? I'll answer this through experience. I'll use that word first. I know Father God is no respect of a person. Yet the Holy Spirit works in his own time. And I say this. In the last, and to be honest, in the last two years, since I've been coming to, to the church on the Reverend Him, I have prayed to Father I mean, I, I can go back to the beginning uh, when I, you know, wanted to, you know, talk here about God. I heard, but I didn't receive. I had like itchy ears, okay? And I went, you know, my way, but still some way within me, I knew that I wanted my life to change. I didn't want to, I don't mind saying this. I didn't want to continue on in that life, as you say, carnal life, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking now in my illness. I had 
called upon the Lord to forgive me. And I know he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But I've heard those words so many times. And I'm going to say this again and make it very short. I'd ask these questions by the same answers I'm getting now from Reverend Him. And those answers, those questions, those answers never came to me. So I'm going to get this word. I asked so many questions until they excommunicated me from the church. But that's okay. And I don't regret that. But as in the last two years, I began to seek the Lord from my heart. I cried to Father God to help me through these trials I'm going through now. He said, I'll never leave you or I'll never forsake you. I remember those, those words. So now it's to me, I am a, can I say, a new beginner in the Lord. I receive his word. I know his word is true. And he, he, the, the Holy Spirit teaches you and guides you and leads you into a, a better understanding. It's a lifetime. Amen. But the things that you're going through, you cannot help because the word's been there throughout the years. Like he quenched the Holy Spirit, you know what I mean? And the words were there, but now they're being to come out more and more and more and more. So that's my part of the. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there anybody else on the phone that wants to speak? Since we'll wait for that. I'm going back to 1 Corinthians 3. I have some foundational uh, scriptures. You ask what it is when you just start out. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, we are babes in Christ. We're babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. We're babes in Christ okay. when it comes to the word of God that you're, you're getting milk, sincere milk. And look what it says here. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. And as people are just learning about the word of God, when they first come to Christ and they're just coming for the invitation to discipleship, there's an expectation that you are repenting, that you're opening your heart to receive what the Holy Spirit wants to teach you about the word. But you're not coming full grown. You're not coming knowing everything. Nobody knows everything. Reverend Helm didn't go to glory knowing everything. There's no preacher, whether they call themselves a bishop or apostle, they've been this, uh, you know, theology, they've gone to this seminary, they've got this PhD and this. Nobody knows everything because this word is from the Father and the yes. Son and the Holy Spirit. But it says here, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. Even now, you're still not able for you are still carnal. For where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and not behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? And you would say, well, they're talking about those disciples. But people can say, oh, I'm part of this ministry and we have 5,000. I'm part of this, this bishop's person. I'm part of this team and we're just from, we're from this state and we're doing great things. All of us are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not followers of the bishop. We're not followers of the apostle this. We're not an apostle. We're not followers of anybody but Jesus Christ. And when we start thinking in divisions to say, hey, I'm better than you because I look like this and I have this and we have this ministry and we have this many programs, we are carnal minded. And we're still sipping on that milk. That's why the reverend asked before he left, are you serious about the word of God? Because when you start to get serious about the word of God, carnal things won't distract you, won't cause your mind to be focused on things that are not of Christ. Now, the second question was asked, am I, I don't want to, Stop anybody who wants to answer that first question. So if you do want to answer it, let me know because we're going to go to the second question. The second question that was asked was, when, do you, when did you become serious about Jesus Christ's church? Now, I can tell you, I told you a little bit about when Christ said many. And what happens is some people get focused about the church, 
But remember, we are the body of Christ. We are the church. The church is not a brick and mortar. What we found in, in the time of the pandemic of 2020 and what we're having now is when the doors of the brick and mortar had to be shut, that didn't shut us up. That's why we Reverend kept saying to be shut in, but we're not shut out. Because we are the church. We are the body of Christ. The temple of the Lord, the word of God is being proclaimed through each and every one of us that wants to follow that great commission. So we have to understand that's what we, the church is not a building. The church is not a bank account. The church is not some entity, 501c3 or otherwise. We are the body of Christ. But I want you to understand when did I become serious about Jesus Christ's church? I want you to go to Revelation. So Revelations chapter 3. Many of us know the different letters to the churches, to the angel of the churches. But I can remember that when I read, when Christ is in red letters, and I read about us being the body of Christ in other scriptures. But here's the thing. When you go to chapter 3 of Revelation, I'm going to start at verse 14. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now we just read in John 1. It's in red text, so we know it's Jesus. But we read in John 1 that everything that was created was him. So here it's plainly Christ. Verse 15 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. As a young kid, vomit gets gross. I've seen dogs vomit and eat their vomit and it's gross. I lived in the country. I vomited when I got sick, and it's gross. It's gross, gross, gross. But to hear the Lord God say that scripture when I was a young child impacted me because what he was saying, I'd heard people say they're on the fence and people are backsliding. Those are words I heard when I was going to church. Didn't really understand what backslidden meant or people say, oh, that's an old backslider. As a young kid in middle school, I didn't understand it. And even as a grown-up now, I hear People talk about that less and less. But here's the thing. The Lord says make a choice. And that's what I used to set, tell the people at the nursing home. I said, don't go and take your last breath. And you go before God. And he's going to say to you, did you accept my son or did you reject him? That's the choice. It's not a hard choice. You either accepted him or you rejected him. You can't come and say, oh, I hadn't figured it out. Too late. You accepted him or rejected him. If you didn't make a decision, that's a rejection. But when Christ says he would that you were either cold, that means a rejection. You totally don't want nothing to do with him. You're out there and you know you're running for the hellions. You're going to hell. You're working with Satan and all of his imps. You're cold. You ain't even pretending. You know that you know that you know. You don't want nothing to do with Christ. You reject him outright. Or he wants you hot. You're on fire for Christ. He's part of you. You're part of him. You've received him. You've repented. You're working every day for the salvation, which is a process. Sanctification, the, the evolving of who Christ wants you to become is a day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. But here we got a lot of church folks. Now, I don't say Christians, church folks, members who when Rev asked a question, when did you become serious about Jesus Christ's church, that's our body. We're the church. When did you become serious? I realized at that state that I told you I was carnal, that I was in the lukewarm. I didn't really know Christ in a way that I needed to know him intimately, so a part of me was rejecting him. A part that could get me in hell. Because any part that rejects him is going to hell. And I was in a state where I was playing church. I could go to church. I can listen when I want. I could sing good songs. I could go and serve some chicken dinners. I could go and I could wipe the floors. I could pick up the program. I could wipe the dust that's in the, the spider webs all around the church. I could be the good little two shoes that I thought I was being. And that was going to be all right. But that was lukewarm. 
and Christ would vomit me out of his mouth because I wasn't making a choice to accept him. I wasn't being serious. I was playing games and I was on that fence saying I want one foot in hell and one foot in heaven. And it doesn't work that way. He says you either are going to be cold or hot. And he said I would that you would be cold. He said that first. I would that you be cold. At least be honest. And that's what I think some people that look at these little videos, y'all not being honest. If you're going to not go to church for 50 years and say, I'm, a, I'm okay with God, don't lie to yourself. Don't get to hell on your own lie to yourself. Because Christ says here, I know your works. And he could say that to me. I wasn't serious. And you could say, well, how did you know that so young? I know what serious is. I ain't dumb. I ain't no dummy. I know what people tell me about being real. And my brother, it was my brother, Aaron, when he got saved, because he probably was in that same bandwagon, we knew how to be churchy. But when he came home and he was hot, he was hot. He was hot for the Lord. I saw hot and I realized I was nowhere near it. He repelled me. Everything about him made me want to just, ugh, because he was wanting to hear the scriptures he wanted to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear it in the morning. He wanted to play gospels. He wanted to be all excited. He wanted to give me a Bible for Christmas. I was like, ugh. So I knew I wasn't like he was. And then I hear this scripture about, I would that you be cold or hot. I knew I was lukewarm. I knew I was playing the straddling of the fence. And that was not going to get me to heaven. So that's my time when I knew that I knew I was not serious. And when the Lord spoke to me in a night vision to say to me, I don't know if I say vision, but I can say the word of God. I heard it audibly. It wasn't a vision. I audibly heard it. And he said, know me. And I knew it was Christ. And it broke everything in my heart. It was playing games. And I knew I had to accept him and repent. And accept them. And I was crying so much that I had a little tiny trash can next to my bed. And I could hear the drop, 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 drop. And I said, I got to get up. I can't stay in this bed. I got to go wake mama up. I, Pam was in the bed with mama. And I said, I got to tell you, I got to know Jesus. That's how serious I was. So I asked you, Sister White, when did you know, when did you become serious about Jesus Christ's church? And if there's somebody else on the line or if there's somebody on Facebook, feel free to say what you got to say. Sister White, do you have an answer? I'll keep on reading. Yes, yes. I thought something else was coming in, coming in, you know. You no, know, you can speak. I remember, if I can go back a little ways, as you, you still spoke about the way backsliding, it's being more or less cold and not hot, right? Yes. And I'm thinking, yes, in the church when I was found about maybe 10, 11 years old, I thought that, you know, not knowing about baptism, that baptism, you, you saved, you saved, you know what I mean? So you go on and they call it backsliding, I say hot and cold. And I did my little thing, I don't mind saying, you know, and I thought I was miscued to shoe and so forth and so on. But I will say this, in the latter years of my life, I keep saying this, and coming on through life, and I thought about this here. I said, Father, I know I'm not doing the right thing. Show me your way. Show me how, what am I supposed to do? You come to God with a, with a contrite heart. You ask for forgiveness and ask him to you know, come into our lives. Believing that he is the son of God mm -hmm. and he is a creator and he's the one that gives you salvation. That I knew. I knew that. But I ignored it, okay? And sometimes God gives you a bit, I say, of affliction. I'll use that word if I may. Can I use that word? You can. Yes, and he, he will use this. He will allow it. He will allow it. He will allow, allow it. Allow it. Allow it to come into your life, you know, and have you. It's like you, he, he brings this remembrance back to your heart. And he brings it where you have to confess. I'll say in my little closet, it's not all getting out of public and 
praising God and saying, I have been, I, I have repented. If something goes on in your life that you said, the Holy Spirit moves you in mysterious ways, okay? And it comes to you in, in a point of, of, you know, friction or chastising, I would say, right? Am I saying the right word? You're fine. You say the words and, you know. That's fine. That's fine. And I'm thinking now and still now, I think of life a little more different because I said, Father, I want to be your child. Help me to understand, you know, the word of God. Help me to speak the word of God as I'm in a conversation, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I talk to him personally. And he helps me in my Bible study right now. And I remember, I never look at the Bible. I was looking and said, oh, well, it's okay. Yeah, I'll get it another day. But you know, God draws you through his word when he wants to. Right, right. And you cannot help, you know, by the Holy Spirit driving you and drawing you to the Word of God. And it brings things back that you remember. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. So I know there's other people on the call because I saw that there's other people. So you're being quiet tonight. The third question that we have is if you found that somebody was asking you about your Christian salvation and they asked you about it, where would you take them in the Bible to talk about your Christian salvation? So for myself, what I would do, I would, I would share with them John 3.16, of course. But I would say something about that before I got there. I would share that Nicodemus found himself as a teacher. He was a teacher, but he recognized that he needed to know something more. That he was missing out on understanding things that he needed to go to Christ for. And even for myself, when I got accepted Christ, I was listening to things in the Word of God that I had heard years before, but there was something intimate that was reaching me then. And just like Nicodemus found that he went at night and he went privately and kind of unawares by other people, he actually went and talked to Christ and had this conversation in John 3. And it was him, him going at least to talk to Christ, asking these questions and hearing from Christ himself that he had that opening and that's what happened with me. When I started opening my heart to realize that something was different, I, it was Christ that, that shared with me. There's a comment. Uh, I'm Pam said, One, I became more serious about the Word of God in 1994, and I started attending more Bible studies and reading more, but I still struggled. I became serious about Jesus Christ March 1995. That's when I wanted to know more and read more, and my life changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. So yeah. when Nicodemus was talking to Christ, it was Christ giving him this understanding. We always go to John 3.16, but I think we have to understand that Nicodemus pursued Jesus. And I think sometimes when you want to have that relationship with Christ, you have to have the Holy Spirit draw you. It yeah. says, as I be lifted up, I'll draw a man unto thee. So the Holy Spirit will woo you and draw you, but then you have to oh, do yeah. the step to say, I repent. I repent. And that's why when you see this conversation with Christ and Nicodemus, here's the thing. I'm going to start at verse 6. That which, John 3, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And people have to understand, this is where I would say, I am going here because I heard that expression, born again, but I don't know at that time I understood the fullness of it until the Holy Spirit was drawing me. And that I had that audible say, I had to know Christ. And it made me realize that there had to be a change in me. I had to repent of my sin, but I had to grow, go to him in a way that I'd never gone to him before. And it wasn't in a flesh. It was my spirit that had awakened at that night. And it says, yeah. verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So it 
is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And that's what I think that as somebody new who wants these questions answered, even as, as you see things on the Facebook and you experience them, people want to understand, but they don't want to be beat up because they don't understand. They don't want to be made to feel like, oh, you don't understand? You've been going to church all your life? You are a preacher this? You are, you are a deacon this? You are a trustee this? They, they mm -hmm. want to understand. Just like Nicodemus. He was a teacher. Yeah. And Christ did say, you're a teacher. But he didn't throw it up in his face like that, but he explained it. And Nicodemus took the next step to say, he didn't understand. And he said, how is this? And Christ had to expound on it. And that's what I think as you hear the question of, how do you tell the person that asked the question, how did you become a Christian? For me, I go to John 3, and I t walk them through that everybody has questions. But if you just lead your life, and never go to Christ and have yourself submit to him to say that you repent, that you've made a mistake, that you don't understand, that you need help, and that you want to have that relationship to be born again. Just like Nicodemus. But then Christ goes to explain. Verse 11, most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things... Salvation that we're talking about is not earthly. Where my husband is now is not earthly. He had to hold on to something that's eternal, that's more than the earth, because his body is a part of the tent of the earth. It's corruptible. But when Christ starts to talk about things, he's not talking about earthly things. So he says, most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I had to... Recognize that I can't be lifted up. My achievements can't be lifted up. My name can't be lifted up. My bank account can't be lifted up. I had to lift up Christ. And when I looked to him, I recognized that he's holy. I'm not holy. No. He requires me to repent of my sins that I've committed that are against him. And how he created me. He created me, and because of Adam's sin, I have that sin nature. But the only way that that sin nature can be washed is because I have to go to him who is without sin and have him wash me so that I can be presented to the Father, not because of me, but through the Son. So when I think about this question of where do I take somebody, I take them to this passage. And then you're not even at John 3.16 yet. You're at the part to recognize who he is. And then you get to 16. And it says, for God so loved the world. Not the world. And that we're the world. We're the people that Adam and Eve, through that sin, and everybody born out of that sin, we're part of the world that's damned to hell unless we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, yes. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay. Back in, in Genesis 3, that, there's a question coming up about grace versus faith. When, when the Lord, the Father, after that sin that Adam committed and that sin nature would be a part of everybody's DNA, everybody born, all the cute babies, all the ugly babies, all of us, yeah. Yeah. we have that sin nature. We're born and shaped into iniquity, that sin nature. But out of the grace of what God knew what Christ would do for us, that he would sin, that he would voluntarily go, that was in Genesis 3, and here we're in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, back in Genesis 3, loved us enough, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's what I would tell somebody asking me that serious question, because a lot of people are thinking that when you die, whether you commit suicide, you have a tragic accident, you overdose, you have all kinds of stuff happening to you, you're shot by a stray bullet, whatever happens to you from the time you're a baby until you're old man, old woman. 
if you die in the sin of Adam's sin nature without the, the cleansing of Jesus Christ's blood and repentance of the sin and accepting Christ as the Son of God and believe and have the faith of Christ, you will find yourself in the lake of fire in hell with the devil and the demonic host yes. and all the reject, people who rejected Christ. And you don't want that. But he says here, should not perish and have everlasting life. But the next statement says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But here's the thing. When you start to have that serious conversation with somebody about your Christianity, you know you can't say it's any of your righteousness. It's only Christ's righteousness. But here's the thing. There may be a person that comes to you to ask this question, but they say, I'm not ready yet. I don't believe. I had a girlfriend say to me, I don't believe Jesus like you do. And what she was telling me is that I don't believe that he's the son of God. I don't believe that I need him for salvation. I don't need what you're telling me about Christ because I don't believe it. I don't receive it. And therefore, she's rejecting Christ. Not that I haven't. I, I pray in like the Mark 4 and the seeds. I'm sharing seeds. Even that person yeah. came to my husband's memorial service. That is an opportunity to share more seeds because her adventure, something was said that she'll receive. Her carnal mind will receive and she'll accept Christ. But it says in verse 18 of John 3, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men yeah. love darkness. Y'all remember what we said in 1 Corinthians 3? We love yeah. darkness. The carnal mind loves darkness. Rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. And does not come to the light. Lest his deeds should be exposed. Christ said in Revelations. I would that you were cold. That you admit you love the darkness. You love the darkness and you can't stand the light. You can't stand Christianity. You can't stand Christ. He said, I would that you were cold or hot, but that you're lukewarm. I'll vomit you out of my mouth. The last question says, were you saved by grace or by faith? Were you saved by grace or by faith? Now, Anybody on the telephone want to answer that question using a scripture? I know, Sister White, I haven't let you say scriptures because you've been talking, but I want people to use scriptures. Were you saved through grace or faith? Before I end it, I'm going to say, give you some answers, but I'm going to use the scriptures. What scriptures are you going to answer that? That serious question that Reverend Helm asked weeks ago before his, he passed. Were you saved by grace or or faith. Did you want my scripture, Hannah? Was? Yes, yes. Uh, Romans 3, 22, 23. All right, Romans 3, chapter chapter 3 of Romans, 23 and, 22 and 23. All right, you can read it. Okay, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. You all will believe. There's no difference between, there's, okay, I'm sorry, darling. This righteousness. I'll read it for you. God even even, faith, even the righteousness of God through faith yes. in Jesus Christ to all yes. and on all who believe, for there is no yes. difference. For all have sinned and fall yes. short of the yes. glory of God. God. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep reading. Being justified okay. freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set okay. forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance of God, he passed over the sins that were previously committed. That you have to have faith in Jesus Christ and through the blood so he can wipe away that sin that we have. God's grace allowed us to have Jesus Christ. The grace of the free gift of eternal salvation is Genesis 3 in action.
But we have to believe, we have to receive, we have to repent, but we have to have faith in Jesus. We have to believe that he is the only begotten son. We have to believe that he was without sin, that his blood, his righteousness washes away our filthy unholiness because the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. So we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. We have to repent. We have to believe. We have to have faith in Jesus Christ. Here's some other scriptures. That was in chapter 3. And I'm going to read. Um, I was going to give you Romans 3 verses 21 through 26, Sister White. So you've already kind of covered that. I'm going to go now to Romans 4, chapter 4, verse 13 through 16. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, faith in Jesus. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So you can't just say it's for Jews, which is the seed of Abraham, because we're all, we're all grafted in through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all adopted because of the heir, Jesus Christ. His blood is grafting us, bringing us all together. So it's just Gentiles and it's Jews. It's anyone that receives the word of God, the, the faith of God. Through Jesus Christ. My last scripture will be Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hallelujah. Now, I got to tell y'all something. I've, get, I've been getting a lot of um, checking in. I've got more texts and phone calls and people calling to check in on me and Faith in Albany. Thank you very much. There are times in grief, there's stages of, of grief that all of you all know. When I was getting ready, I had my makeup on, I had the teaching ready, and I was getting ready to prepare and I realized last Friday, Reverend Watts did the Bible study, but this is the first time I've really been in sync to pay attention to the Bible study and realize that Reverend's not here to do it. And I remember that I looked at his teaching earlier in the day to see what he had said, but it actually hit me like before the teaching that, you know, I had my eyes meditating on what I was going to teach, but I remembered that Rev was not here to teach it himself and do a marvelous job that I know he would do. But thank God for the Spirit of God to give me understanding of the Word to be able to teach. But ebbs and flows of grief, Faith, Albany, all of us who love David, Darlene, Blend, all of us who love Rev, we have memories, we have stories, we have interactions that nobody will ever take from us. But we know he is with the Lord. And that I, I'm not trying to make y'all think that I'm not sad. I miss my husband. I miss my friend. I miss my brother. But the reality is he has taught us. He has shown us the word of God. Now it's time for us to be the Mark 4. We're throwing the seeds out. And we don't know what the ground is that is going to be harvested of those seeds, but we are responsible to go and to share the message of who Christ is, to share the good news. That's what we're doing. We're keeping on to do the work of Christ because he's worthy. And we're going to be serious about the word of God. We're going to be serious about Jesus Christ's church. We're going to be able to talk to people like the Romans Road tells us about, to share our faith, our testimony, so we can share and lead people in whatever means or methodology God brings to you to share who Christ is. And we're going to recognize that because of God's grace and his mercy, that we have a faith in Jesus Christ to repent and to accept him in his free gift of salvation. I love you and Lord willing, uh, Reverend Watts or whoever will be teaching, will be teaching the Bible class and come join us on Sunday where we'll have church school at nine o'clock. 
10 o'clock. Sorry, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And then at 11 o'clock, Lord willing, Reverend Watts will teach the Word of God. I love you. God bless you.